A few years ago, Houston, Texas, my hometown, a city of four million people, experienced firsthand the ravages of a devastating flood called Hurricane Harvey. It's estimated 50% of the people who lived in Houston had some sort of water damage from the hurricane, and it's taken our city years to recover. You know, I had friends' homes who had five and six and seven feet of water in them. The stores where we shopped were covered and all of the things were turned over to its side. I'll never forget walking into a friend's house and seeing the refrigerator on its back because the water had done that. It didn't matter who you were or where you lived. If you experienced Harvey, you remember it and you were impacted by it. As the flood water started to recede, the city began to go to work to help their neighbor. And the stories are incredible. There were people who called for boats and boats would be sent out in the middle of the night on rescue missions. And there are people who went house to house to clean out flooded homes. The city and the churches and the community came together all to help one another. And I'll never forget the smells and the piles of people's homes now flooded, now ruined, all the extra things they'd bought thinking they were gonna save being carried to the corner for a trash collector to come pick up. There were piles, six, seven, eight, nine feet tall. I will never forget all the laundry, all the laundry you do for people when all their stuff got wet and flooded and ruined. And the people who set up grills in their front yard and made heroic efforts to go get food to feed all these first responders. You know, everybody around the world, it feels like, worked to get needed supplies into our community. And there were makeshift stores set up so that if you needed something because you flooded, you could go get clothes or food or paper goods or baby items, whatever you needed for free. Amid the devastation of Hurricane Harvey, the world rallied around Houston. And you know, as I look back on it, it's a hard experience and it's an emotional experience, but it's also filled with some really incredibly amazing and sweet moments. And in fact, with a little distance, it's hard to separate the hard from the sweet. Now, this might sound like a strange comparison, but as I read Isaiah chapters one through 39, you know what I see? I see hard moments intermingled with great promises and incredible encouragement. Amid these statements of judgment, amid this, this declaration of judgment, the Holy One, remember that's God, and we've been talking about Him in these lectures, the Holy One offers certain hope, hard and sweet. If I had to reduce Isaiah chapters 1 through 39 to one sentence, I would say, Amid statements of judgment, the Holy One offers certain hope. And so we're going to break this passage down together today. We're going to look at it in two divisions. We're going to see that the Holy One offers certain hope to Judah in chapters 1 through 12, and the Holy One offers certain hope to the world in chapters 13 through 39. So grab your Bibles, open them up to Isaiah chapter 1, because I want you to see that much of what I am saying to you is coming directly from Scripture. Now, Isaiah chapters 1 through 5 tell a story of certain judgment. In fact, when you begin in Isaiah chapter 1, you're going to read God's indictment of Judah. And that indictment is going to go all the way through chapter 5. And here's what God's going to say. God's going to say that though they're His people, they've rejected and rebelled against Him their father. Now, what have they done? Well, they don't care about justice or the oppressed. They acquit the guilty for a bribe. They'll deny justice to the innocent. Their land is full of idolatry. It even says they parade their sin like Sodom. In chapter 5, it talks about women who are haughty and flirty. I mean, it's so upside down in Judah that they call evil good and good evil, all the while behaving this way while carrying on in their religious practices as if 
following a set of religious rules shields them from living like children of the Holy One. And God says, that's enough. Don't even bother. Don't bring me your sacrifices. Stop praying. I'm not interested. Can you imagine religious people pretending to be one way in front of God and living a completely different life when they're perceived they're outside of his presence? That's what the people in Isaiah's time were guilty of. That might be what some in our time are guilty of. And God says, this will not stand. Don't bother pretending. But even in the midst of saying that, where you might think his conclusion is, I'm done with you, God invites repentance. He says in chapter 1, Come, though your sins be as scarlet, they can be as white as snow. There's a story of repentance and restoration embedded in judgment. Now, chapters 6 through 12 offer certain hope. We look at the hope that God offers through the atonement in chapter 6 last week, if you were with us, as we studied about this man named Isaiah, who's writing this account. When we get into chapters 7 through 12, what we see is a practical example from Judah's history to demonstrate how God worked through promises and signs to extend certain hope to his people, both then and now. So let's look at those chapters. Now, the main character in those chapters is a man named King Ahaz. And tensions are high for King Ahaz because he believes he's about to be invaded. So God sends Isaiah to say to King Ahaz, keep calm and don't be afraid. Did you know that's in scripture? <laughs> These kings may be plotting your ruin, Isaiah says, but God says it will not happen. So King Ahaz, stand firm in your faith. If you don't stand firm in your faith, you won't stand at all. In other words, Isaiah is saying to King Ahaz, listen, don't be tempted to make an earthly alliance. Don't go tr out and try and get other nations to be on your side or to support you or to fight with you. Don't try to figure this out on your own. Stand firm in the promises God is making you. And as Isaiah is talking to King Ahaz, God makes this incredible offer. It's actually incredible. God says through Isaiah, just ask me for a sign. Like, ask me for a sign to show you it is true. So Isaiah says to Ahaz, you can ask God for a sign. Just so you know, you can believe all of this. If you need that confirmation, you can ask for it. And in that moment, we find out something about the character of Ahaz, because he piously says, I will not put God to the test by asking for a sign. When in reality, God had extended that, and King Ahaz is merely testing the patience of God by being pious to act like he doesn't need a sign. But Isaiah goes on and says, God's going to give you a sign anyway. And what unfolds in chapter 7 through 12 is not just one sign. It's a series of signs and promises. It's made in the context of an invasion, but as you listen to these signs, you're going to recognize they hold great significance into our certain future hope, into the believer's certain future hope. So we start in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, where we have the sign of the sun. The scripture says, The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and he will be called Emmanuel. And while there are questions about exactly what this meant in Ahaz's time, we know several things about this sign. First, Emmanuel means God with us. Ahaz can keep calm and not be afraid because God is giving him a sign. He's saying, I'm going to be with you. Through this sign, I want you to know I will be with you. You do not have to be afraid. Now, we can't tell you exactly how that sign was fulfilled in Isaiah's time. 
but we do know exactly how that sign was fulfilled later on in history. Because when you get to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 through 23, you're going to find that this sign was fulfilled in the birth of Jesus. The scripture says, you will give birth to a son. You will name him Jesus, because he will save people from their sins. He will be called Emmanuel, God with us. So Isaiah gives Ahaz this sign, and Ahaz is counseled to stand firm in his faith because of this sign. But you know what this sign also reminds us of? This sign reminds you and it reminds me that because of who God is in the person of Jesus Christ, we too can stand firm in our faith today. We can stand firm in the struggles of today knowing God is with us. Now, I said there were a series of signs. There are. There's another one. Isaiah says that he and his children will be signs and symbols in Israel. Chapter 8, verse 18, when you see these boys, when you hear their names, remember that Israel's enemies could devise a war plan, but it would be thwarted because God is with us. Scripture goes on in that passage to say, God will be a holy place. He will be a stone that makes men stumble and a rock that makes men fall. I'm just lifting it straight out of scripture. So I really encourage you to go into the book of Isaiah over these next few weeks and read it again with a highlighter. Highlight all those verses you've recognized that you've heard before and now you realize where they're coming from in scripture. So God promises the sign of a virgin who will give birth to a son and God says Isaiah and his children will stand out as signs and symbols. And the signs continue in verse 9 as we find out more about a son. It says, For unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The signs continue in chapter 11, where we find a shoot is going to come up from the stump of Jesse. So we're learning a little bit about the bloodline of this person, this son, this life that's coming. And from his roots, From Jesse's roots, a branch will bear much fruit. It goes on to say, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. You see, what Isaiah is trying to say over and over is that what's coming is bigger than a little old invasion that Ahaz is dealing with. God's using Isaiah to say, amidst all this talk of judgment, there is a certain hope coming. There's a Messiah coming. There is one who will rule rightly. Don't we long for someone who will rule rightly? He will change things. He will be from the promised line of David. I'm sure it was cryptic to Isaiah and to Ahaz, but this does not have to be cryptic to you and to me today. We don't have to guess who these signs point to. We don't have to wonder how these promises were fulfilled because the New Testament account of Jesus Christ points out in multiple ways and multiple times that Jesus fulfilled these promises. Now, Jesus is also known as the second person of the Trinity, sometimes called God the Son. And as I told you already in Matthew chapter 1, when he's born of a virgin, when he enters this world through birth as from a virgin, he's given the name Jesus because he will save their people from their sin. He is called Emmanuel, God with us. You say, we know Jesus to be more than simply a man. While he is fully man, he also shows himself to be fully God. The one who the spirit of righteousness rests upon. And when we speak about Jesus, 
Sometimes we talk about him as the second person of the Trinity, God the Son. But more often, we talk about him as God who came as a man. Now, very few people debate whether Jesus was a real historical person. That's not usually the question. The question that's often debated about Jesus is, was he the Son of God? Is he God in the flesh? And this passage in Isaiah makes promises about a ruler who will rule and lead and conduct business in a way that a sheer man cannot. It will require the Spirit of the Lord to lead in this way. In other words, he would have to be God himself to lead the way he leads. Now these verses take us back in Scripture to the great promise that God made to David about a descendant on the throne who will reign forever. And death will not defeat him or negate his rule as it has for every other ruler. So here we have sign after sign after sign, given not only to Ahaz to trust in the Holy One, but given to you and given to me. And just like God used Isaiah to speak a message of hope and truth in Ahaz's day, God is still using Isaiah to speak hope and truth into the circumstances of our day. See the signs. Remember the promises he has kept. Remember that his ruler is ruling now and forevermore. God wanted Ahaz to understand, and God wants you and me to understand that we can trust him. We can trust him in our present situation because of what he's done in the past and because of what he's doing in the future. It's as if God is saying, trust me now, there is certain hope. I've given you so many signs that I won't forget you or forsake you. You can trust me. It is though God is saying, I'm working in ways bigger than you could ever imagine or understand or recognize in the moment. Trust me. You know, the lesson for you and me as we go through this division, as we think about how do we bring it forward to our time, the lesson for you and me is that the Holy One offers certain hope to those who trust in Him. The Holy One offers certain hope to those who trust in Him. Now, I used certain hope. I did that on purpose because in Scripture, when you see the word hope, it's a certainty. It's a certain expectation of an outcome. It's not wishful thinking. It's not like, oh, I hope we get to do something or, oh, I hope this happens. When Scripture uses the word hope, it means this is a certain outcome. Now, I realize it's very easy for me to tell you that the Holy One offers certain hope to those who trust in Him. It's easy to say, rolls right off your tongue. So it seems only right to tell you that even as I give this lecture, I'm dealing with a situation in my life that requires me to consider the signs carefully. In fact, it requires me to watch the signs intently because from my vantage point, I don't see a way out. Doesn't it sometimes feel like we live in that virtual reality? where what we see is so incredibly powerful, we forget there's an unseen world. From my perspective and my vantage point, what I see is so incredibly powerful in front of me, and I, I can't figure out a way out of it. So I have to remember, I'm not seeing the whole picture. You know, I don't know how God plans to use this situation I'm in, but I do know this passage reminds me that he's given me sign after sign after sign that I can trust him with what I cannot see, that I can stand firm in my faith, and in fact, if I don't, I have nothing to stand on at all, and that I can be calm and carry on. So I wonder what you've set your gaze on. What are you staring at? What's right in front of you that you're staring at? What are you telling yourself is more real than God and his promises? What are you telling yourself is bigger or harder or more impossible to deal with against God? It's the Holy One, Jesus Christ, who offers certain hope. And that's not just to a select few, that's to the whole world. So where is God inviting you to trust in Him? And I'm going to encourage you 
that perhaps instead of asking God for a new sign in your current situation, God, I just need you to do this or show me this. Instead of asking for a new sign, would you go back and look at the signs he's already given you and see how he speaks to you through that? Ask him to show you how those signs that he's already given, those promises he's already fulfilled, confirm and encourage you and strengthen you in your circumstances today. Because God continues every day to offer certain hope to his people, to the people of Judah and to the people of the world. So in chapters 13 through 39, God offers certain hope to the world. Let's start with 13 through 23. Those chapters are directed at individual nations. Now, we invited you to read as much or as little as you wanted to this week, as you had time, and I'll grant you they're hard chapters to read, but here's what happens in those chapters. God addresses the nations at Babylon, the Philistines, the Moabites, Damascus, Cush, Egypt, Edom, Arabia, Jerusalem, and Tyre. And if I were going to sum up at a high level what we learn from these chapters, it would be that the God of Judah is the God of all nations. And the God of all nations is the rightful judge of every individual nation. Now, even as I say that, even as I talk about the judgment of God, what I want you to know is amid statements of judgment God is gonna to make to the nations, he is also going to extend and offer certain hope. If you're able to go in and read these chapters, what you're gonna find is these incredible statements of judgment mingled with compassion to the foreigners, mingled with promises of rest and peace, in chapter 16, you're going to find a promise of a throne being established. One from the house of David. Sound familiar? One who would seek justice and rule in righteousness. These chapters make it clear that judgment is coming. They make it clear. You don't escape judgment. But what they say is that God has offered a way through judgment, a way to be delivered through the judgment instead of being destroyed by the judgment. Because even amid these statements of judgment, God, the Holy One, continues to offer certain hope. You will find a day when people will look to the Holy One of Israel. You will find a day when people join together around the promises. You will find a day, one day, when all the nations will worship together. That's what's unpacked in these chapters. Isaiah reminds these nations there is a righteous king coming, one from the line of David, one who will bring forth justice and righteousness. Don't we long for a king to bring forth a ruler to bring forth justice and righteousness? And while every earthly ruler will continue to disappoint us in some way and will continue to be judged and will continue to prove themselves to be imperfect or wicked, or unjust, there's another ruler coming. In other words, the hope around the promises that God offers is not extended to one people group, it's extended to every tribe, every tongue, every nation. And as certain as hope is, so is judgment. Chapters 24 through 27 are sometimes called the little apocalypse. Yet another form of writing that Isaiah uses is another way that he sets out to communicate this one vision from God, the Holy One. And chapter 24 describes a sweeping judgment. It describes a devastation that is to come when the Holy One will ultimately judge, rightly judge, every single wrong. Now let me just slow down again and say that again. There's coming a day when the Holy One will ultimately and rightly judge every single wrong. Now that can be frightening, or that can be comforting. In one sense, it's very comforting. It means we don't have to figure out how to right every wrong we see today. It means we don't have to take vengeance on people. It takes us out of the place of judge, and it assures us that nothing escapes God's purview. But it would be incredibly frightening 
Were there not extensions of certain hope offered to people? Trust in me. Trust in me. That is the way to hope. And on the heels of chapter 24 and this devastating judgment, we find in chapter 25 and 26, chapters of praise, chapters of hope, chapters of hope for those who trust in the Lord amid these statements of judgment. Truly, the Holy One is the only hope of mankind. Judgment is not the only option. The Holy One offers hope. He will swallow up death. He will dry our tears. He will establish peace. And we know from the New Testament, that's what Jesus came to do. That's what Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us did on the cross. He swallowed up death. The tomb is empty. He established a way for there to be peace, peace with God, and peace with others. Now, chapters 28 through 35, I've called certain hope. And you might think that sounds strange because if you open your Bible to chapter 28, you're gonna see it starts with the word, woe. I call it certain hope because every time you read a woe, you find out that the Holy One is the answer to the woe. So chapter 28 verse one says, woe to that wreath the pride of Ephraim's drunkards, to the fading flower, his glorious beauty. Woe to him, because the Lord is destroying him. That wreath will be trampled underfoot. But there's hope, because in that day when the wreath is trampled underfoot, the Lord Almighty will be a glorious crown, a beautiful wreath for the remnant of his people. Now that word remnant, that concept of remnant, that's hope extension. That's the idea that not everybody gets destroyed by the judgment. Some are delivered through the judgment. If you continue to read in these chapters, you find the Lord will be the wreath. He will be the spirit of justice. He will be the source of strength. He will hold back the battle at the gate. He will be the cornerstone. God brings hope in the woes. You simply just can't call these chapters bad. They do paint a reality. They paint our reality. We live in a broken and fallen world. And were it not for God, were it not for the Holy One and the person of Jesus Christ, it would be crushing. It would actually be devastating. But we know that God made a way through this broken world, through Jesus Christ, God the Father made a way for this broken and fallen world to know beauty and peace and restoration through Jesus Christ, his Son, the second person of the Trinity. It's Jesus who makes forgiveness possible. It's Jesus who makes justice possible. It's Jesus who makes healing possible. It's Jesus who makes reconciliation possible. It's Jesus who offers hope and deliverance we're all in a hopeless situation apart from Jesus. That's not a future state, that's right now. We're in a hopeless state apart from Jesus Christ. You know, it's tempting to think about the hope that Jesus offers as something in the future. And it's tempting to wonder, yeah, but, but what about right now? Because I live in this fallen, broken world. You have no idea what's going on in my life, Holly. You don't see things that I've seen. You're not experiencing what I'm experiencing. It's really tempting to think to ourselves, this is a future state and there's not much for me right now. Thanks for the future reality. What do I do about today? But chapter 33 speaks to us now says Jesus is our strength every morning. Even now, Jesus is our salvation in our time of distress. Even now, he is a sure foundation for our times. Even now, he strengthens your feeble hands. You know, these chapters are rich. You know, I have to tell you, Isaiah is my favorite book of the Bible, and I'm just dying for you to read every word of it. Like I do, I want you to read every word of it. I long for you to go in and see how God's weaving his truth into this book. I know you may not be able to. I also want you to know it's a worthwhile endeavor should you decide to. 
chapters 36 through 39, are a narrative. They're a story. They're the story of what does it look like in the life of someone who believed God's promises. Hezekiah's story shows us moments of humility and dependence and trust. Hezekiah was the king. He's that main character of the story. But what you're going to see in Hezekiah's story is while he does demonstrate humility and dependence and trust, there are imperfect moments. Scripture will call him a good king, but he doesn't always have good moments. And frankly, good isn't good enough to escape the judgment on his own. No one's good enough to escape the judgment on our own, which takes us back to Emmanuel, God with us. You see, Hezekiah had good moments and moments of pride. And in the midst of his story, God extends hope. And Hezekiah believes in that hope. In the midst of this story, God answers Hezekiah's prayers. In the midst of this story, God shows grace to Hezekiah. Now, how encouraging is that? Because the reality is, at our very best, We might have some decent moments. We might have an occasional moment of humility. We may have a little streak of dependence and trust, but they're so imperfect if we're just being honest with ourselves. And if God is counting on us to have perfect moments, we're in trouble. In fact, we're hopeless. But what I want you to see is that God extends hope into those moments. God intervenes with grace into those moments through the person of Jesus Christ. You know, even the fact that God calls out sin is an act of grace. I mean, if God didn't tell us what sin was, if he did not call out sin, how could we possibly know we're in a hopeless state? How could we possibly understand what's in store for us How could we possibly understand his expectations of righteousness? With each and every warning of our sin, there's an invitation to repent and trust. It's like a reminder, hey, you don't have to live that way. You're only hurting yourselves. You can turn away from that. I offer something better. Many of us listening today know that's true, but maybe not all of us. Many of us listening can say, yes, it's good of God to call out sin. That is an act of grace, but maybe not all of us. But God is so gracious to help us understand that he extends something to us freely. He extends hope to us freely. It is simply ours to receive. And for those of us who know it's a gift that God would call out our sin and identify in that, that in us, Well, that's why we share the gospel. I mean, how sad would it be for someone not to know these things? How sad would it be to go all the way through life and have no understanding or recognition of the righteous requirements of the law and the grace that God extends through the person of Jesus Christ? All the way through this book of Isaiah, we see this truth continuing to emerge. Each warning from the Holy One presents an opportunity to embrace judgment or hope. Each warning from the Holy One presents an opportunity to embrace judgment or hope. Now, we, as imperfect people, we have a tendency to confront people with their sin, like point it out, because we want to condemn or shame or look what you did. How could you do that? But when God confronts people with their sin, he's inviting you to turn away from it. He's inviting you to get out of it. He's inviting you to repent and to trust him. You know, sometimes I hear people talk about the God of the Old Testament as an angry God. And I want you to know the God of the Old Testament is compassionate. He's gracious. He's incredibly patient. He warns people. He explains what will happen. He invites people of any nation to come to him. It is such an unfair characterization of the Old Testament to call God an angry God. Even as you listen to this, even today, as you encounter the reality of judgment and the promise of hope, you and I become the story. 
You see, we become the Ahaz and the Hezekiah in the story. We all come to points of decision. We all come to opportunities to trust and believe in God. We all have these moments where the choice is in front of us. Do we turn to the Holy One who extends this hope and lean into him, or do we turn our faces away? Will we reject the signs that God has given us? Ask God to give you this perspective on the book of Isaiah. Ask God to help you lean into the promises. Ask him to help you see what you can't see on your own, to give you eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart to understand what you could never understand on your own. Ask God for this perspective on the book of Isaiah, on the Old Testament, on the truth of who he is, because much like my perspective was changed as I lived through and experienced Hurricane Harvey, so that it's impossible to separate the sweet from the devastation. It's impossible to lose the images. That's how we can view the book of Isaiah. It's impossible to separate judgment from hope. Isaiah speaks of a devastating day, and at the same time, he offers incredible hope because God has made a way for people to escape judgment and be in right relationship with him. And that way is through his son, Jesus. And today, he invites you to embrace certain hope. Will you?